Come with me for a moment to the year 2025. How? With the power of thought. Okay, okay. Admittedly, we can't actually transport you to a new moment in time just by thinking about it. At least, not yet. But come with me on this journey and imagine with power of thought and take us together. Today, you are part of one of those extraordinary moments. When something so groundbreaking comes along that it shatters the bounds of possibility and pulls entire industries into a new era. My company is proud to be a torchbearer, bringing ideas beyond science fiction to the public. Devices so intelligent in functionality that they transcend traditional computing and integrate into all aspects of our lives, enhancing the ways we learn, create, and communicate all without lifting a finger. My team has long awaited this product launch, adopting a business philosophy of advancing knowledge, empowering productive people, and cultivating positive global impact. And today, I'm proud to unveil to the world the first highly advanced, non-invasive brain computer interface device for the consumer market. With this, experience all new levels of immersion in your education, work, and play, and heighten connectedness to your home, family, and life, all while working in tandem with the most complex structure in the universe the human mind. Those are the words I plan to speak in just a few years' time when my company unveils its first product to the world. You might have noticed that my words are reminiscent of Steve Jobs' 2007 keynote speech when he unveiled the first iPhone to the world. I chose this parallel because I believe that brain-computer interfaces will have an even greater impact on the world than that of the smartphone. And this. No, that's not the device I will be showing, but instead an early stage brain sensing EEG headset that my research group, the Neurotechnology Exploration Team, or NXT, is working on right now in partnership with OpenBCI to empower disabled persons to reach new levels of communication and freedom of movement. On the surface, my talk is about the incredible work that neurotechnologists at NXT and around the globe are doing right now, and why this technology is an idea worth sharing and pursuing. But underneath, I hope to construct something greater. I hope to put together a narrative that encourages all of us to take on big ideas, to pursue a passion, and to provide your own unique value to, to the world. To do this, I will take you through my story. This idea to use thought, this idea to use thought to power all kinds of action, opportunity, and possibility came out of a time in my life when the very act of thinking was incredibly painful. When I look back now, I see my life as having two parts. Early on, I had wanted to be a robotics engineer because I'd heard, among other things, that engineers got paid pretty well and they got to solve the world's problems. <clears throat> this seemed cool to me. And in my spare time, I remember making these elaborate robotic sketches and I envisioned my creations having a big impact on the world. But I didn't know exactly how or what a big impact even meant or most importantly, why I wanted to have a big impact in the first place. I had this linear idea of life, get good grades, go to college, get a job, etc. I told myself this was respectable, but what it really was, was comfortable. This person in seventh grade thought he had life all figured out. He had no idea what was to come. What followed would be an event that I now see as having been an opportunity, an opportunity to learn and grow and reinvent myself, but it took me a long time to come to that realization. <coughs> May 20th, 2012. I was 13 when I was assaulted. It was an impulsive attack, nine boys, several beatings, and it left me with a traumatic brain injury, years of struggle and daily head pain, but an enduring will to get back up on my feet. The first year was the hardest. I, I lost a lot. Dizziness and daily headaches just made it all too easy to stay in bed. And these migraines, they came with severe cognitive impairments, like losing the abilities to read, to write, and to speak. In fact, I was terrified to speak because I couldn't always count on words to come out right. My dreams of being a robotics engineer shattered. What good is an engineer that can't do math, or that can only work for 15 minutes at a time before his head pain gets too great and he has to stop? When I finally did return back to school about four months later, I could only be there for two hours a day. And I was in the back of the classroom with an ice pack on my head, sunglasses on my face, my head down on the desk. 
I was the concussion kid. I was different. I was demoralized and depressed and ready to quit. I remember looking through some of my old robotics designs, and I found this one for uh, an Iron Man type suit, an exosuit. But the idea was that instead of creating a superhero, it allowed persons with mobility impairments to walk again. But in this moment, more than ever, I needed to be my own superhero. Because just the act of thinking about this suit, just thinking about it, not doing math, not doing designing or anything like that, sent shooting pain to my head. But this was a pivotal moment, because as my hand went up to caress my head, I realized something. My arm, my fingers were willed into action by neurons in my brain. And, and neurons, they're like electrical signals, they're like circuits. So what's stopping us from just tapping into those signals and using that to control the system? I mean, this would be completely agnostic to the user's ability to move independently. I started to do new research, and a fire was ignited within me when I realized that not only was this possible, but already in practice under the term brain-computer interface. I found videos like these. This video shows ALS patient Kathy Hutchinson giving herself a drink of coffee by herself for the first time in more than 10 years using a brain-computer interface and a robotic arm. And then, and then I found this video. This video is from the Walk Again Project, which is spearheaded by neurotechnology visionary Miguel Nicolilis. This shows a man otherwise unable to move his body, betrayed by his body, walking again, using just the power of his thought and a non-invasive brain-computer interface and an exosuit similar to the one I had dreamed of. I started to do more research on the brain and I realized that not only would this be a transformational medical technology, but for the general consumer as well. Because the areas of the brain required to make a really effective interface are fairly topical and, relatively speaking, easy to access. The area of your brain that does most of your visual processing is right here at the back. At the top is an area that allows you to move around in the world, and just behind it, the area that gives you your sense of touch. By working with these areas in the brain, we could create interfaces that are entirely intuitive, completely human. Imagine being able to enter into an interface, screens moving in and out of your vision at will, to be able to receive information, complex information like that from the stock market, as simply as you receive information from your senses today to be able to send someone a thought in all of its entirety, as simply as you send a text message today. To be able to move into entertainment media as if you're really there, and yes, to finally know where your spouse wants to go for dinner. <laughs> okay, so that last part was a joke, but these things got me really excited in the technology, and I decided on that day that I was gonna be a part of it. On that day, I made it my vision to build the first company to mass market these devices so that everyone would be able to benefit from them. And on that day, I found meaning in my life once again. I started to look at my situation not as a disability, but as an opportunity. An opportunity to learn and grow and to recreate my brain in the way that I wanted, in a way that helped me to achieve my new goals. I worked really hard in rehab, and I slowly regained the abilities I lost. I forced myself to get up in front of the school to speak and to read, no matter how embarrassing that was. I continued my BCI research to advance online coursework in business, computer science, and neuroscience. I remember I would study the, ha the habits and attributes of leaders that I looked up to, like Elon Musk, and try to apply them to myself. And I even built a productivity system that would track every minute of my day meticulously to try to predict when I would have the next headache, so I could stay ahead of it and be pro as productive as possible. At the time, I was going into my junior year of high school, about four years after the initial attack. I had my first day without head pain. At this time, I was launching my second company. My first was a multinational e-commerce company that I created out of necessity, because I never thought I'd be able to have a real job. My second was a digital services company that operated five profitable subsidiaries. Both of these were a way for me to hone in on my business skills, but both of them came from this deep inner need for me to go my own way and show myself that I could still do it. When I came here to RIT, I had a mission in mind. I wanted to take my BCI research and advance it to the college level. And with help from advisors, mentors, and the School of Individualized Study, where I'm currently pursuing a degree in neurotechnology, I am making that happen. 
Going into just my second year here, I founded the Neurotechnology Exploration Team. This would be the first entirely undergraduate-run research project in RIT's history. And as such, I wanted it to be different. Instead of taking big budgets and blowing it on fancy machinery, I wanted to focus on the end user at all times. That meant keeping usability high, ideas plentiful, and costs low. Early on, I met an entrepreneurial software engineer, Colin Fosnott, with a comparable passion for BCIs. He quickly became a co-executive on the project, and the two of us transformed NXT from just an idea to an organization of more than 35 members, community impact, and more than a dozen impactful projects by the end of just our first semester. We built things like a prosthetic arm, a RC cars that would drive around, um, a robot that would respond to brain signals and look at people as they walked by. And for RIT, we even built a tiger head that would roar when the user made the ASL sign for tiger. Now in our second semester, we aim at a higher goal. We want to take what we learned from all of this work in semester one and apply it to things that really matter in the areas of communication and mobility. We have a group that's working on building a video game controller right now to help rehabilitate people. So instead of doing that boring exercise um, in physical therapy, you could make Mario jump with a muscle movement. And we're building a video game to go along with that. Our prosthetics team is working tirelessly to lower the costs even more and make their devices more usable. We have a wheelchair project that's helping anyone, regardless of their ability to move their bodies, move around within the world. And we're even working on a thought keyboard that will allow the user to think of a letter and have it displayed there on the screen. <coughs> Throughout all of this, we remain focused on the end user. We have specialists dedicated to increasing usability and comfort, and of course, we are keeping costs low. As just an example of that, our prosthetics team has that arm that I keep talking about, down to under $100 for all the electronics, all the parts associated with it. So why is that important? Because an arm with the same functionality built out of standard materials would have cost you tens of thousands of dollars. This means that for children, that as they grow need to have their arms replaced every few years, can get that opportunity. And this is just the beginning of our work. I came here today to talk to you a little bit about BCIs. Why? Because I think the technology is important, really cool, and has unparalleled potential to better human lives. But behind the science and technology lies a passion, a passion that fuels tomorrow's discovery. And that passion for me came from an idea, from a thought. And that's what I want to leave you with today, how powerful a single thought can be. Now just imagine where the power of thought can take us together. See you in 2025.